Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks. It's a little bit, well, a little bit of weather going on outside, so thanks very much for, for being here. Um, please, right now, before we do anything else, please turn off the volume on your phones and other devices. Um, before I introduce Walter Echohawk, I want to make two brief announcements. First, I want to acknowledge with respect the Oneida Nation, the Oneida Indian Nation, on whose ancestral lands Colgate University is located. We have some members of the Oneida Indian Nation here with us today. I want to offer them a particularly warm welcome. Secondly, Brian Patterson, a member of the Oneida Nation Men's Council, has offered to provide a welcome to our guest on behalf of the council. So right now I'm going to invite Mr. Patterson to the stage to give the welcome. Saguli Sagwag, Yahweh Skanu. Great to see you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out on such a uh, wintry day. Uh, you know, in our, in our language, we look at the phase of the moon, and we say we are in the freeze or break your ears cycle of the moon, and certainly you can feel that outside. Uh, so, Saguli Sagwag, Yahweh Skanu, Laskal Haget, Niunget. Welcome to this important lecture. Uh, thank you for the acknowledgement of uh, the ancestral homeland of the Oneida Nation. This land uh, holds the bones of my ancestors since time immemorial. Uh, so here at Colgate University, uh, my English name is Brian Patterson. I'm a member of the uh, uh, Bear Clan of the Oneida Nation. And as uh, we get uh, wrapped our minds around uh, the presentation in front of us, I would just like to borrow a little from our culture uh, to greet such a prestigious uh, 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 representative into our homelands. Uh, so just a few words uh, with me. Swadehutsi gadoyokwa. Swagwe gu uska jiatwa winuni agwa ni gu denu na heladun ji gadoyokwa ji yawe skanu ji nyutu hage agwa ni gu. It is good that we gather and we wrap our minds in peace and righteousness. And so it is that way amongst us and that has come to our minds and our attention, uh, our intentions at this time and place. And so it is with us. I would like to uh, ask my wife uh, to come forward uh, as we begin uh, an ancient, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll draw from the ancient traditions and cultures and life ways of my people and we'll do, we'll, we'll do a symbolic woods edge greeting. This is the greeting in which we've welcomed all guests and travelers into our homeland back in the day. Uh, before I do that, I would like to ask for all the indigenous women in this room to rise. Indigenous women, please rise up. Rise up. The heartbeat of our nations, thank you for standing. Thank you. Uh, the heartbeat of our people, uh, our ancestors, uh, 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 rise uh, from this heartbeat. Uh, these are the ones who have endured uh, and sustained our life ways for over 400 years from manifest destiny and doctrine of discovery. Thank you, women, for standing. Uh, I ask you also, as they stand in front of you, I give recognition to missing and murdered indigenous women, the heartbeats of our women, sustain our, our life ways for our future generations coming forward. Indigenous men, please stand and rise in protection and stewardship of our ancient life ways, uh, our homelands, our territory, and the preservation of our culture and those faces still coming forward. Indigenous men, Yawango, thank you for, for standing. Mr. Echohawk, will I have you standing? May you come forward, please. So at this time, we're gonna make a gift to our esteemed visitor. Um, this eagle came to me, and on behalf of my husband and myself, We'd like to give this to you. And my husband will use it to bless you all. And I've also brought uh, sage from my vision quest. We bring the sage in the four directions that it allows you safe travels from our homelands. And as we dust you off, we ask that you think of all the good things that you have come to see and hear and experience while you are in our homelands. 
Uh, we hope that everyone has treated you very well and respectful. So at this time, I would like to symbolically draw from our Woods Edge address and first offer you clean, cold medicine, the cold water uh, that will soothe your, your throat so you may speak all the good words. So in that Woods Edge Address, we symbolically uh, remove any attachment, any uh, uh, burrs, any attachment to his clo clothing. So now he is presentable. We, had, uh, we offered him life medicine, the water, so now he can speak of all the good things. We have cleared his eyes so he can see all the good things that are in front of us. And we removed anything that would prevent him from hearing. So now he can speak, uh, see, hear, and speak of all the good things that are before us. So thank you for this opportunity to come before you and allow me to uh, just wrap up my words and my language. Uh, so swagwegu, swagwegu, skaji atwa wenu ni ugwa ni gu de nun hela de unya ungo suguya di so ji oyenta unji gunulungwa 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 ji ni duhage ugwa ni gu. We save our best words to our Creator and give thanksgiving for all the blessings, all that is prepared for us. And there's a word yo oyenta un. I said that means to live your life in a good way in which you are prepared for what is in front of you. And so these. These are as much words as we have said together. Um, my wife and I, we would like to give a uh, gift to you, uh, this tail wing of the eagle, uh, so that you will remember us in a good way and have safe journeys back to your homelands, back to your territory, and thank you for the time you share with us. But this time I'm going to, traditionally, my Cheyenne people, I'm not from this land. I'm always conscious of that. I'm on someone else's land. And it's traditional. We go somewhere else. We thank the people of that land. So I thank the Oneida people. But in uh, our Cheyenne tradition, if we lay a gift at your feet, and if you accept it, then that means you accept our gift. You accept that you have a responsibility to us to speak in a good way, to come in a good way. And we have a, a responsibility to do the same for you, to treat you in a good way, and to help you while you're here, and to encourage you and remember you in our prayers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Patterson. Mr. Patterson was joined by his wife. Her name is Renee Romanose, um, a member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho Nations. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to everybody else. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I just have a few brief things to say before um, Mr. Echohawk will come up and speak. Um, I want to uh, offer my deep thanks to three people who've invested a huge amount of work in making this visit possible. Amanda Stewart, Darlene Curtis, and Carol Ann Lawrence have been instrumental in arranging this visit. Professor Lawrence, in particular, has worked tirelessly to organize this event, and I'm extremely grateful to her and to the Native American Studies Program for making this lecture possible. Thank you. Thanks. So here's how things will go. Um, Mr. Echo Hawk will speak for, um, for approximately one hour, maybe a little bit less. And then um, we um, will be offering um, uh, um, the, the ability to, the opportunity to purchase books and also to have a book, have your book signed by Mr. Echo Hawk. Um, so um, once, the, once his talk is over, we will come over here and um, he will sign books and he also will answer questions. So if you have questions, you'll be able to, to ask them directly to him. Um, I want to give you all, a, before I give you all a sense of um, Mr. Echo Hawk's enduring and important work, I want to remind us 
just for a moment, of the mandate of the Arthur W. and Anne Hale Johnson Religion and Ethics in America lecture series. This is a series that's been going on for a number of years. This series was created to teach us about some of the ways in which religion is a, is a part of a larger national conversation on community, ethics, and justice, and how they are developing in the 21st century. Um, over the course of this lecture series, we've explored a wide variety of issues relating to religion, community, ethics, and justice in the United States. One issue that has surfaced in a number of these lectures has been United States law, and the question of the law's capacity to provide just and equitable resolutions within a pluralistic society. One of the ways in which the US legal system promises to provide such resolutions is through its commitment to prohibiting the establishment of religion and protecting its free exercise. Indeed, these are the very first words in the Bill of Rights to the US Constitution. Yet, the history of Native Americans' interaction with the courts reveals a different side of US law, an inverse system or a dark side, in which, in many cases, the religion of Christianity has been unequivocally and even forcefully favored by the state, and in which Native claims to religious free exercise are, to this day, dismissed or even denigrated by politicians and judges. One of the reasons we've invited Mr. Echohawk is that he has been committed throughout his career to pushing people to think carefully and critically about the law and its various promises. I would argue that we can't talk about religion and ethics in American life without engaging in a critical assessment of the ongoing failings of US law in its treatment of religious minorities and particularly the religious practices of Native Americans. But Mr. Echohawk's work in this area goes far beyond the realms of legal history and legal theory as an attorney, he has worked on the ground for over 40 years as an advocate for Native communities. He's a Pawnee Indian with a BA in political science from Oklahoma State University and a JD from the University of New Mexico. In this capacity, he represented Indian tribes, Alaska Natives, and, Ho and, Na and Native Hawaiians on significant legal issues in the modern era of federal Indian law, and he's been a key figure in the rise of the tribal sovereignty movement in the United States. Mr. Echo Hawk has litigated indigenous rights cases pertaining to religious freedom, prisoner rights, water rights, treaty rights, and reburial and repatriation rights. He was instrumental in the passage of the 1990 Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, and he fought to obtain passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act Amendments of 1994. Since entering into private practice in 2009, Mr. Echo Hawk has represented various Oklahoma tribes. He has served as a justice on the Supreme Court of the Pawnee Nation, Chief Justice for the Supreme Court of the Kickapoo Nation, and has taught law at Tulsa University's Law School, Lewis and Clark's Law School, and University of Hawaii School of Law. He's received numerous awards, and he has authored four books, including In the Light of Justice and In the Courts of the Conqueror, and his most recent book, The Sea of Grass, all of which you can purchase after the talk. Please join me in welcoming Walter Echo Hawk to Colgate to talk to us about the lingering Indian problem in our democracy. Thank you. Wow, that was an awesome introduction. Appreciate that, uh, Gina. And um, I want to uh, thank Mr. Patterson and uh, wonderful wife, uh, Ms. Uh, Roman Nose, you know, for uh, the wonderful welcoming uh, here. You know, I've traveled a long ways. It took me two days to get here, fighting the first of all landing gear on day one, and then the um, yesterday. Um, so I'm very glad to be here, this wonderful, beautiful campus and this uh, awesome uh, place here. Uh, and very privileged, you know, to be in the land of the Haudenosaunee, uh, uh, Six Nation Confederacy, or Cor Confederacy and uh, Oneida homeland right here. And um, I do appreciate um, all of the uh, courtesies, you know, that have been extended to me. Native American Studies program and, and the Department of uh, Religion. Uh, and it's good to see my old uh, colleague, uh, Professor Vesey, as well, uh, here from the Department of uh, Religion. And uh, I appreciate each of you for uh, braving the snow and being here uh, with me this evening. Uh, I am honored uh, to be part of this uh, religion and ethics uh, uh, lecture series. And um, as mentioned, uh, my topic, or the title of my talk this evening is The Lingering Indian Problem in Our Democracy, Bringing Religious Liberty 
and restorative justice for First Americans. And uh, this topic uh, concerns the uh, general situation of indigenous peoples in the United States and uh, the need to provide uh, uh, more vibrant religious liberty and bringing uh, restorative justice to our Indian uh, uh, peoples, uh, Native Hawaiians, Alaska Natives. And um, along the way, I want to also examine the, the general relationship between our democracy and its indigenous peoples. What was that relationship historically? What is that relationship today? And what should that relationship be into the future? And in thinking about these issues at the outset, I'd like to pose this question to you. How should we comport ourselves to the native peoples in our land? That's the fundamental question, it seems to me, that sits before us. And how our democracy answers that question will tell us much about our character, I guess, as a nation and as a uh, demo free and democratic peoples. And I think that uh, it is timely to uh, have such a discussion uh, today. Um, our relationship with America's indigenous peoples. There's two reasons why I think this is a timely discussion. The first, the first is it's a global question now facing uh, 72 countries around the world, a worldwide uh, question for uh, democracies and other modern nations that have uh, indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, because the United Nations uh, 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 development and, and approval of the landmark uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples lays out a brand new human rights framework for the world's indigenous peoples to provide them with remedial uh, justice and uh, restorative uh, uh, justice and human rights uh, after the close of uh, the era of colonialism. And it asks each nation around the world, each UN member nation, to begin working with indigenous peoples to uh, implement these uh, uh, minimum human rights standards for their indigenous peoples. And so uh, uh, this is a global question being uh, uh, considered by modern nations around the world, those 72 nations that were former colonies, what to do with their native peoples now in a post-colonial era. Uh, secondly, uh, the second reason uh, concerns the very troubled times uh, that we're living in today. You know, here in the United States, uh, we see that our democracy is experiencing a very scary uh, political times. Our society, it seems, is deeply divided, uh, marked by a uh, uh, rising incidence of hate speech, hate crimes. Um, our civil discourse has uh, devolved, it seems, uh, into name calling. Uh, we see our uh, political institutions in Congress and our major political parties are highly polarized uh, by extreme partisan uh, politics today uh, in which uh, uh, rivals uh, see their opponents as enemies, as uh, traitors to the state, uh, criminals that ought to be locked up in, in uh, prison, and uh, we witness our, our central government in Washington, D.C. being very unstable, subject to gridlock, subject to uh, shutdowns and uh, partisan strife, attacks on the free press, um, and uh, 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 personal attacks on uh, uh, political rivals, you know, that we've really not witnessed in, in years uh, uh, 
before, you know. And so uh, I think that uh, political scientists will, will show that, um, and there's writings on this subject, that since about the 1990s down to the present day, our democrat uh, democratic norms that undergird our democracy of, of uh, political tolerance, institutional forbearance have been seriously weakened and are under assault today, you know. So, so uh, there's concern out there among political scientists and others, you know, that these elements indicate a gradual slide towards authoritarianism. Uh, we see that in this uh, national uh, emergency and uh, so-called the national emergency and the power grab that's uh, going on there. Uh, and these factors have led some political scientists to wonder, you know, is this how a democracy collapses? Uh, so it's, it's uh, very uh, sobering, I think, to, to uh, uh, see that we are indeed uh, navigating very troubled times, troubled waters, uh, to be sure. And in times uh, such as this, um, our government's treatment of American uh, minorities um, says very um, uh, much about our democracy. And when and where Indians are concerned, uh, the eminent uh, uh, Felix S. Cohen, the uh, father of uh, uh, federal Indian law, modern federal Indian law, called the American Indian um, the miner's canary. And he observed, uh, made this observation in 1953 uh, during the McCarthy era, that America's treatment of its native peoples is sort of a barometer. A, uh, a barometer of the United States, uh, uh, the health of, of the United States democratic norms and our commitment to fundamental liberties. Uh, he realized that if our democracy can't protect, lacks the vitality of protecting even the most weakest, most vulnerable and most despised segment of our population, then we most likely lack the vitality to protect the rights of the rest of us, you know, from tyranny. And so uh, Cohen wrote, and I quote, like the miner's canary, the Indian marks the shift from fresh air to poison gas in our political atmosphere. And our treatment of Indians even more than our treatment of other minorities marks the rise and fall of our democratic faith. So even in these troubled times today, I think we need to take special care of the status of minorities in our society um, to sit, ensure that their, their situation and their rights are safeguarded. And so this afternoon, uh, what I'd like to do in my talk here at the podium is to examine the question, uh, the larger question of how should our democracy, our free and democratic society, comport itself to America's indigenous peoples in, in the 21st century in a post-colonial world. And I want to cover three areas with, with you, uh, so bear with me because I want to brush in fa fairly broad strokes here to cover a lot of ground. First, I want to provide a uh, framework for understanding the Native American situation in our democracy today. Uh, then secondly, I want to look at the need for bringing restorative justice and religious liberty for the first Americans. And then thirdly, I want to examine uh, this uh, new human rights framework, this UN declaration that comes to us 
from modern international human rights law as possibly the answer uh, to our colonial legacy here in the United States. So let me turn to my uh, first uh, task here, and that is uh, to try to get a framework for understanding these issues. Uh, and I'd like to present, uh, uh, begin with uh, some uh, quick uh, baseline information about Native America, um, and then go on to, uh, 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 from, from that point. Uh, and the reason I want to give a little baseline information is that there's an unfortunate information gap about Native people in the United States today. Most of our citizens think uh, Native Americans are extinct uh, or know very little about Native peoples in our country, have never met an American Indian, have never talked to an American Indian, have never been on an Indian reservation, and are, have not been taught anything in uh, their formal education about indigenous peoples in our country. Uh, therefore, we see uh, uh, a lot of stereotypes that are circulating out there. Many of our citizens are hostage to stereotypes that come to us from Hollywood or sport teams or what have you. And federal Indian law, which is the legal framework uh, for Native America, our domestic legal framework and policy, uh, is simply not uh, well understood by most, most Americans. So I think this is the fault of the schools and it's also the fault of the public media not to cover indigenous issues uh, and uh, the lack of any uh, public discourse of any kind regarding uh, our relationship with the uh, American Indians, our Native Hawaiians, and our Alaska Natives. So at the outset, let me uh, provide some quick uh, uh, baseline data. Um, the, according to the 2012 census, there was a population of 5.2 million uh, Native Americans in, the last, uh, in, that, in that particular census. And by Native Americans, again, I'm referring to American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. Uh, who are in the eyes of uh, international law, uh, uh, non-European uh, peoples that inhabited our land before it was colonized uh, by Europeans. So with 5.2 million population and growing, I just wanted to lay that out because our native peoples uh, uh, are still here. We did not go extinct and we never vanished, you know, the vanishing red man theory, but rather we are here, we're growing, we're alive and well, and don't plan to emigrate anywhere because this is our uh, aboriginal homeland. Uh, there are 560 federally recognized Indian nations that comprise our domestic political system. 300 of these uh, tribal governments uh, are located here in the lower 48, 200 up in Alaska. These uh, Indian nations uh, uh, have a formal treaty relationship with the United States government. They, they maintain a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States government. Uh, these tribal governments uh, were the only uh, ethnic minority in our country that actually has our own governments. Uh, but most of these governments are full service governments. The tribes have a court system, legislative branch, police force, fire departments. They own and operate uh, tribal colleges. They run uh, tribal museums. Uh, they're uh, the economic uh, engines that uh, supports their uh, local and sometimes regional economies, very much a part of our domestic uh, uh, political system. According to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, 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 calls our Indian nations domestic dependent nations. 
that maintain a protectorate relationship that came into the Union under their treaties, through their treaties, under the protection of the United States government as a, a, a protectorate in the international sense. And as I mentioned earlier, the rights, responsibilities, and relationship of these Indian nations is defined by federal Indian law. It's a federal body of law uh, comprised of hundreds of treaties, thousands of federal statutes, a whole bunch of uh, Supreme Court decisions. Um, then uh, we have 369 formal treaties between these Indian nations and the United States. Again, this makes Native America unique because this segment of our population has formal treaties with the United States government that were entered into uh, by the executive branch or the president pursuant to the U.S. Constitution, uh, approved by a two-thirds uh, consent of the Senate, signed into law by the president that under the Supreme Court decisions uh, are, are therefore the supreme law of the land. Um, as far as land ownership, um, my last uh, look at that, uh, the uh, Indian nations and, and native peoples own 100 million acres of Indian trust land that's held in trust by the United States government for our native people. Uh, 56 million in the lower 48 and 44 million up in Alaska. That makes our native people the second largest landowner in the United States after the federal government, um, and the third largest mineral owner. Uh, we, we have about 44 million acres in uh, range and grazing land, uh, 5.3 million in, in acres in uh, commercial uh, grade forests, old growth forests, two and a half million acres of crop land, 4% uh, of our oil and gas reserves, 40% of our uranium uh, deposits and 30% of our western coal reserves are under uh, native ownership. They're held in trust by the U.S. government. As far as habitats, America's native peoples uh, live in very diverse habitats, beginning with, at Martha's Vineyard, uh, all the way to the islands of Hawaii, and in between uh, these uh, Diverse uh, homeland habitats are uh, like the Florida Everglades, uh, the floor of the Grand Canyon, mountains, the Great Plains where I come from, islands, uh, coastal zones up and down all of our uh, uh, east and west coast, um, desert habitats, rainforests in the Pacific Northwest and Southeast Alaska. The Arctic uh, circumpolar world is inhabited by uh, uh, indigenous peoples as well as, uh, as well as Indian nations that straddle both our borders, on so the northern border and the southern border as well. These diverse habitats uh, house, um, I would say, most of America's remaining biodiversity is under native uh, uh, stewardship, you know, in some of the last best places in our country. These awesome habitats have produced over millennia some very profound cultures, very profound cultures and indigenous cosmologies, ways of looking at the world. Uh, hunter, fisher, and gatherer, uh, um, uh, and primal uh, uh, religions, uh, so to speak, you know, uh, that add uh, much of our uh, American uh, diversity that we enjoy here. Uh, these native people, these 5.2 million native people, uh, live life at the bottom of every socioeconomic indicator from uh, violence to uh, suicides, poverty, income, uh, uh, housing, medical, life expectancy, uh, uh, are, at, are the poorest of the poor and, the, and from that standpoint the most vulnerable of our population. From the modern era 
from say 1970 to the uh, present day, uh, Native America has witnessed a, a very uh, significant social movement towards self-determination. It began with President Nixon's uh, uh, announcement of the Indian self-determination policy. And it took about two generations to implement that self-determination uh, self for tribes around the country in a social movement, a legal movement, uh, where we have witnessed the uh, rise of our modern Indian nations that we now see across the uh, country. Uh, historians have uh, uh, classified this movement as one of America's great social movements that uh, rivals the women's movement, environmental movement, uh, black America's stride towards equality. Uh, our goal in the tribal sovereignty movement was, was uh, for self-determination, self-government, to protect our cultural integrity and those, those kinds of uh, things and to rid uh, the United States of the lingering ill effects of a legacy of colonialism. Um, I think we've faltered in recent years in our stride towards uh, self-determination, as that's defined by modern international law. Uh, so we have big challenges ahead. Um, and um, I think that of all of the forces in our diverse society, the predominant uh, force that shapes Native America uh, today is this legacy of colonialism as America uh, expanded across the uh, country, uh, as manifest, manifest Destiny took shape, um, marching uh, uh, through uh, Indian lands. Um, uh, our, all of our tribes were colonized. And, you know, I think that in our diverse society, all groups that comprise uh, today's society um, um, have had unique historical experiences during the rise and growth of our democracy, whether they be Irish immigrants, uh, Japanese Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, um, and so on and so forth, uh, every group uh, has had a unique uh, problems, you know, in, in incorporating into the body politic. For example, black America uh, faced the very brutal uh, institution of slavery and its uh, troubling aftermath uh, during the rise and expansion of our democracy. Native America faced uh, challenges of a different sort, and that was the onslaught of colonialism. Uh, that uh, problems that arise, you know, from, from that. And this uh, con uh, continues uh, to, uh, it was a predominant force that shaped uh, Native America today, and I think provides a helpful lens or framework for understanding today's uh, situation of, of Native Americans in our democracy. So I want to spend just a little bit of time on this uh, uh, idea of a uh, Col the colonization of North Native North America because it was such a widespread phenomena uh, affecting all of our Native peoples in, in the uh, United States. And we still see deep imprints of, of that legacy today are seen and felt in our Native communities. Uh, and we know that uh, the age of colonialism, say from uh, 1492, all the way to 1960, when the United Nations finally uh, uh, declared uh, colonialism to be uh, a repugnant and, uh, and uh, an oppressive institution and called on all nations to, to uh, liberate their colonies. Uh, this was a 450 year period in human history when the nations of Europe competed with one another to colonize as much of the rest of the world as possible. And during that great uh, span of time, all of the Western Hemisphere was colonized, South America, Central America, North America, all the way up to the uh, Arctic region. Uh, all of Africa, Australia, India, Asia, most of Oceania, 
uh, and the circumpolar world were all uh, colonized. This was a worldwide uh, phenomenon uh, that left a very pers for, uh, had a very pervasive influence, you know, on the colonized lands around the world. And um, um, there's a lot of uh, very common features in, in this institution of colonialism, all of which are seen in U.S. history. Invasion and subjugation of the native peoples. Uh, the appropriation of their land and natural resources, a sort of a one-way transfer of uh, property from indigenous to non-indigenous hands. Uh, notions of tutelage and uh, civilization, we're going to civilize the savages, you know, type of a mindset. Uh, governing the natives through uh, uh, institutions of guardianship and trusteeship is a common feature found in colonies around the world. Religious conversion, uh, the notion that the settlers uh, uh, could justify their occupation of native lands to, uh, because they're, they're going to convert the native uh, savages to uh, Christianity. Um, all, uh, all of these uh, common features seen in colonies around the world uh, are present in U.S. history here. Uh, we've had more than 40 Indian wars uh, the, uh, between the United States and our Indian nations. Um, by 1950, there was, we had less than 1% of our land was left, you know, about a half a million acres. Uh, guardianship, trusteeship, that's a, a feature of uh, federal Indian law and a form of governance uh, by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, we saw religious... Uh, a conversion of the uh, BIA and the government boarding schools and uh, uh, in American history, a government-sponsored uh, missionaries. And uh, so the impact of colonialism on the native peoples whose lands were colonized through this process was a harsh, life-altering experience. You know, invasion of homelands, the appropriation of lands. My, my tribe, uh, Pawnee Nation in central Nebraska, uh, today we own a one square mile uh, reservation with some scattered allotments. For, for, from one time we owned all of Nebraska, uh, and most of Kansas from the Missouri River to the Rocky Mountains, you know. So, so we witnessed, you know, the appropriations of land, of natural resources, political subjugation, warfare, sometimes genocide, um, habitat destruction, cultural destruction, um, and er so that today every single solitary Indian nation, uh, a community in, uh, from uh, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, has had a fairly traumatic uh, a history of historical trauma one cataclysmic uh, uh, trauma after the other in their line of histories, you know. So uh, today, uh, this um, legacy of uh, colonialism, even though, as I mentioned earlier, it was repudiated by the UN in 1960, but it's left a worldwide um, uh, legacy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were, are 72 nations now across the planet uh, that were former colonies and that contain indigenous peoples that were colonized. And the question in those nations, including the United States, is what do we do with the native people now? That colonization has run its course, you know. Uh, and there are today uh, 350 million indigenous peoples around the world. That's about six and a half percent of the human population worldwide. And uh, these are the world's, uh, the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable uh, uh, groups on, uh, on the planet uh, who, live, who do live life uh, at the bottom of every socioeconomic indicator. Uh, and they all face a common history of colonialism, 
they have uh, common uh, aspirations as indigenous peoples as far as uh, self-determination uh, to recover or preserve their cultural integrity, their languages. Um, and um, here in the United States, uh, that is very true among our 5.2 mil 5 million uh, native peoples here in the United States as well. Um, and we see that legacy, the imprints of that legacy in the legal system, legal framework for uh, native people in the US in federal Indian law. It was derived from the law of colonialism uh, in the early 1800s uh, by the John Marshall uh, Supreme Court, uh, imported in whole cloth uh, the law of colonialism and shaped it to fit the American uh, setting. And uh, it's got a very, it's got some protective features to be sure of tribal sovereignty, uh, treaty rights, and this protectorate uh, principles are all protective features. And under those protective features, we have witnessed the rise of our modern Indian nations in recent decades. But it's got a dark side as well, you know, uh, that, that holds us back from this law of colonialism, you know, doctrines of discovery, doctrines of conquest, uh, notions of that uh, from the Supreme Court, you know, uh, saying that Indians are inferior, we have inferior uh, cultures, inferior religions, we're abject uh, savages, and, and decisions turning on those descriptions of Native people that are never been overturned, like Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, and so uh, we see that in our law and policy, and these, uh, this dark side of federal Indian law renders our rights vulnerable. And I think that a race of people uh, can only advance so far. There's an axiom here. They can only, you can only advance so far in your aspirations under an unjust uh, legal system, you know, and I, I think that we have come as far as we can go under our existing legal framework because of this dark side uh, from the law of colonialism that legal scholars have traced all the way back to medieval Europe um, that is still governs our uh, rights and responsibilities and relationships with native people in the US. We also see the imprint of uh, colonialism in our tribal communities around the country in these hard to solve social ills of poverty, of unemployment, uh, of uh, 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 lower life expectancy rates, of uh, all of these indicators that despite our best efforts and best intentions, we can't seem to solve them. These are the end products of that legacy that we see. And so the challenge uh, of modern democracies now in the year uh, uh, 2019 in the post-colonial age uh, of all nations, not only the U.S., but all nations that have in, uh, native peoples is to two challenges. The first is to find a just and proper balance uh, between the indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, rights, responsibilities and relationships to, to uh, have a more just relationship rather than the uh, 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 colonizer and the colonized or the conqueror and the, the conquered. We need to restructure that and find a way to do that. And I think the second big challenge for these nations that were former colonies is to go through some social change to evolve from a uh, settler state, a settler state mentality uh, to a more just a non-settler state, you know, that has adapted to the land and the native peoples in a, in a more just uh, relationship in a post-colonial world. So um, in the United States, uh, that I think is the challenge and it's a worldwide challenge, you know, it's, a legacy that we all inherited from this age of colonialism and it's up to us to figure out the most just way of addressing the Indian problem. 
Um, and that's an old question for here in the United States. What to do with the Indian? And th that's been a perplexing political problem ever since the nation first embarked upon colonizing the Indian lands and subjugating the native people. What, how can we incorporate native people into our democracy? Um, the pilgrims wondered, well, is the land free for the taking or do we have to buy it? Do these native people, are they, do they have souls? Are they human? The Spaniards wondered that. Um, how can we live on the same land with colonized people? You know, what, what is our relationship to be? And how do we justify making a colony in the middle of, of native land? Um, so so um, colonialism was the answer in the, in the old days. And now, um, as a uh, democracy that has evolved out of that, uh, we're still pondering that perplexing uh, political question, you know, and it's, it's very troubling for a democracy uh, to have enclaves of colonialism in its midst, to have these dirty little unjust pockets in, of, uh, of a colonialism in the midst of a free and democratic society because the problem is that uh, from a political, theoretical standpoint, Democracies exercise, uh, the legitimate democracies exercise power only through the consent of the governed. And that consent is uh, lacking in the case of indigenous peoples that were colonized because that, uh, they're, they're, they're being asked to come in through co coercion, I guess, you know, rather than voluntarily immigrating to these shores like everyone else did and uh, consenting to the development and building the in free and democratic institutions. So that, that lack of consent, um, uh, instead of trying to get the consent of the governed, when native people were concerned, the U.S. has tried historically many different zigzagging ways of trying to incorporate native people into our body politic. This has ranged from... Uh, the early, um, um, uh, uh, the War uh, Wooster Protectorate principles of Chief Justice John Marshall in, in the Supreme Court cases, uh, the uh, Marshall Trilogy in the 1820s and 30s, that the Indian nations come into our body politic to their treaties as domestic dependent nations. They're not citizens. They have their own self-government, and they exist under the protection of the United States. Then it switched from that uh, manner of bringing Native people into the body politic uh, later in the 1830s to the Indian removal policy. We're going to remove all of the tribes from the eastern seaboard. We're lucky we still have our Oneidas still here in their homeland. But just about everyone else was moved across the uh, uh, Mississippi River, forcibly removed from American society. We were too savage to get along, and everyone wanted our land. It just so happens that the forcible removal uh, has been defined by the UN uh, genocide uh, resolution as an act of genocide. Um, but that was the policy in the 1830s to the 1850s. Then the other uh, uh, fundamental feature of, of, uh, was this 100-year uh, war between the United States and its native peoples from uh, 1876 all the way to 1892 when 40, uh, more than 40 wars and, and over uh, 50,000 people, Indians were killed uh, by the United States Army, and our, our, our country was one vast uh, theater of war for a hundred year period uh, as American uh, armed might uh, came, uh, swept across the uh, country. Um, it then went from uh, that to the ruling of the tribes by wardship, to treat, to undermine the governments and the BIA is going to rule the tribes, 
we're going to teach the Indians how to be civilized, we're going to uh, Christianize them, and then we're going to try to prepare them for our citizenship, which ultimately came in 1924. Uh, that, that policy uh, from the 1880s to 1934 uh, was very, uh, um, uh, included a ban on the practice of tribal religions in the United States and the allotment of tribes to break up the tribal land base. And then uh, another zigzagging policy kicked in in 1934 with the Indian uh, Reorganization Act to restore tribal government and uh, try to deal with Indians that way, to have them build their government. And that was the federal policy from, from the 1934 to 1950 to re rebuild the tribal governments. Then in 1950, Congress uh, had the Termination Act to terminate the tribal governments and forcibly assimilate the Indians into mainstream society in the hopes that they would disappear. Um, so it... Uh, the Congress and the government worked to dismantle as many tribal governments as possible during the termination era of the 1950s and 60s. Then in 1970, the government again zigzagged back to this self-determination policy uh, uh, where President Nixon said, well, we need to rebuild our, our tribal governments and let's let the tribes determine their own destiny. Why have a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. tell the Indians what's good for them? Let's let the tribes themselves make those decisions. That was the only policy that the native people had advocated for. The rest of them were just sort of foisted onto the native people by uh, the government without consultation. But as I mentioned earlier, that, that uh, uh, policy has... Uh, uh, kind of faltered in recent years. Uh, we've lost more than 80% of our Supreme Court cases since about 1985. And um, uh, with this framework uh, that I'm try I've tried to uh, present to you about the uh, way of a lens or a framework for uh, uh, looking into the situation of our native people in the U.S., let's turn now to uh, the need for restorative justice for Native Americans in the United States. And by restorative justice, I'm going to talk about reparations or remedial justice and define uh, uh, restorative justice as uh, the act of making amends. Uh, for a wrong that uh, has been uh, committed. And it's not necessarily just damages or money damages, but this would include any measure aimed at restoring a person or a community from a loss or harm or a damage suffered by a wrong. And the wrong in this instance is the wrong of conquest and colonization. And so under this definition, um, uh, reparations in this sense is an act of atonement, an act of an atonement by a wrongdoer uh, to repair damage, uh, to heal an injury that we have caused, and to allow both the victim and the wrongdoer to go forward in, in good faith, you know, once uh, justice has been restored. And, Certainly, this is a familiar concept for the courts because that is the goal, the fundamental goal of all court systems is, um, is to uh, grant reparations to make sure that, a just, uh, that justice is done for every wrong that is committed, you know. And uh, for nations, uh, nations that, uh, especially that have committed historical wrongs um, against indigenous peoples during this age of colonialism, uh, reparations entails the state's responsibility to repair the damage done to native people uh, in accordance with fundamental notions of, uh, of remedial justice. And, and so that uh, we're looking here in reparations for such nations as measures that are aimed at restoring justice. We know we can't turn the clock 
back, the hands of time back. But we're, we're wanting to see uh, measures aimed at restoring justice through wiping out all of the consequences of the harm and reestablishing the situation ante that would have existed if the wrong had not been produced. And so um, in the United States, um, our, our democracy did in fact in the history of our country commit wrongs against the native peoples of, of our country. American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. And these are wrongs that were wrought by conquest and colonialism. Uh, against Native America during the United States nation-building process as our democracy uh, 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 was established and grew and expanded. Uh, these wrongs were committed against the uh, Native people, and these are inner demons in our history that, that uh, undermine our self-image as the world's uh, leading democracy, and we being the most exceptional people on the planet and show that uh, we have feet of clay, just like other, other uh, nations may have in, in their rise of, of their governments, you know. And uh, because these wrongs are still felt and seen and felt today uh, in the dark side of federal Indian law, uh, and the fact that if you did a comparative legal analysis, as I do in that red book there, The Light of Justice, that many uh, aspects of our federal Indian law and policy and our domestic law fail to comport with the uh, minimum UN human rights standards in the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and there's also social reasons, you know, this historical trauma, these uh, hard to solve social ills that are seen in our native community as the end products of a uh, history of or legacy of colonialism. And we have environmental reasons. Colonialism is hard on the land and the animals and plants as well as the indigenous peoples. And by protecting our indigenous cultures, I think we can see from them and maybe learn the ingredients for a sorely needed American land ethic that will better enable us to uh, um, attempt to uh, meet this environmental crisis. So, uh, but I wanted to give in particular with the time remaining that I have a case study on religious liberty. Religious liberty as another a need for restorative justice for the first Americans. Uh, there is a need to protect the religious liberty of Native America. Freedom of worship is a protected liberty that most Americans take for granted. We see that in the splendid Supreme Court cases, the Yoder decision in, involving the Amish in 1972, Sherbert v. Ver, uh, uh, Verner uh, regarding the Seventh-day Adventists, Thomas v. Indiana Review Board, 1981, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, religious freedom accommodated. Uh, the Gonzales uh, O Centro Espirita case uh, regarding Amazonian hallucinogenics uh, protected for rich white people, uh, the hallucinogenic tea. Uh, the Church of La, La Cumba Babalu, 1993, in which the animal sacrifices from an African-based Santeria case protected. Uh, we see it in the Hobby Lobby case, where even a corporation gets religious freedom. Um, however, that religious liberty has never been fully extended to Native people, and this amounts to a loophole in religious liberty. Um, Native America is no different than any other segment of humanity, and religion is an attribute of people worldwide in all cultures, in all places, in all ages across the, the world. The same is true in Native America. Um, 
our religions in the Western Hemisphere were have been classified by uh, my, my dear friend, the late uh, Houston Smith, in his uh, excellent book, The World Religions, as primal religions. That, and they used the word primal because these are the religions that came first before the historical religions. Uh, uh, human uh, religiousness in its earliest mode. And uh, these are religions by tribal peoples in the Western Hemisphere, people deeply embedded in their habitats uh, that are based on close observation of the natural world and deep spiritual relationships with the animals and plants, you know, that comprise our habitats here in North America. Um, and there's a history of religious discrimination. On Christopher Columbus's first day in the Western Hemisphere, uh, his diary records that on the very first Indians that he saw ought to easily be made Christians because it seemed to me they have no religions. And so that observation uh, uh, implanted the uh, European uh, uh, notion of religious intolerance into this hemisphere. Back in 1492, Spain, of course, was filled with religious intolerance, you know, through the Inquisition, uh, torture, uh, uh, the Crusades, uh, expulsion of the Jews and the Muslims, you know, from uh, the Kingdom of Spain. Uh, and it would take centuries uh, for Europe to move from religious intolerance to tolerance, to actual accommodation of religion that we were used to in our modern de democracies. But in Columbus's eyes and in the pilgrims' eyes, the European mind of the early settlers, uh, the tribal religions, the indigenous religions of, uh, of these shores were seen as simply inferior, barbarous uh, superstitions, I guess, you know. And uh, that, that uh, found its way, uh, that notion found its way into the United States Indian policies uh, in the 19th and 20th century all the way up to 1978 when uh, Congress finally had to pass the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Uh, we saw that mindset uh, in the government uh, uh, funding uh, missionary groups, uh, appointing them in charge of Indian reservations as the Indian agents, violating separation of church and state. In uh, the government uh, conveying Indian land to missionary groups to proselytize Indians, ACLU would never permit that today. Uh, we see that in government-sponsored uh, 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 religion in Indian boarding schools. Um, we saw that in the uh, Code of Indian Offenses in 1892 by Secretary of Interior Teller that banned all uh, forms of tribal religion, traditional religion, something unprecedented in our democracy. And we saw that also in the use of military force to suppress the uh, ghost dance religion at Wounded Knee. Uh, all of these practices uh, uh, violated not only the Establishment Clause, which prohibits uh, 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 church and state uh, uh, and, and, and uh, fostering re uh, one religion over another, but also violated the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment as well. These kinds of problems uh, persisted in, into the, well into the 20th century. The, uh, in 1978, Congress um, uh, held hearings, you know, uh, about, about these uh, uh, religious intolerance and suppression by federal agencies and enacted the American Indian Religious Freedom Act that set a policy from the United States from that point forward to protect the traditional religions of, of the native peoples of the United States. Um, only a policy without any teeth in it, uh, because in the modern era we saw the Supreme Court uh, uh, retreat from that policy in two Supreme Court cases that I want to mention uh, briefly. 
which are still the law of the land today. The first one is uh, Northwest Indian Cemetery Association v. Ling, decided by the Supreme Court in 1989, involving a, a holy place, a vision questing site in Northern California that was uh, central to the religion of the Yurok and other tribes that lived at the base of the Siskiyou uh, uh, Mountains there, uh, National Forest there, and, uh, and along the uh, Klamath River. There the uh, Forest Service was going to build a road through this vision questing area and defor uh, clear cut the, the area. And the evidence in that case uh, was that if they did that, it would destroy this vision questing site where the medicine people of these three tribes go to receive their powers and offer their prayers. And, and that the religions of these uh, three tribes were very dependent upon the religious knowledge that they gained from, uh, from praying up there in the high country. So the court said, if you do this, it's going to destroy the three religions of the tribe. That's what the evidentiary records uh, said. So they ruled in favor of the Indians under the First Amendment. You can't uh, impair uh, the uh, free exercise of religion. It was affirmed in a great decision by the Ninth Circuit. When it got to the US Supreme Court, um, uh, the court ruled that uh, I'm sorry, we can't find any protections at all in the First Amendment for the Indians here. Uh, and it said, uh, we see the evidence, evidentiary record um, says that if we allow this, it'll destroy these religions. But uh, they interpreted the First Amendment to say, even though uh, we're going to destroy these religions, uh, we're not burdening anyone's religious freedom on this. And the way that the court got to that crazy result was it very narrowly construed the free exercise clause to say that it's not triggered unless the government punishes somebody for practicing their religion or coerces them to violate one's religion. And since we're not punishing the Indians, or coercing them to violate their religion, uh, we might, even though we're uh, destroying their religions, we're not, we're not uh, punishing or, or, co or coercing them. Therefore, there's no burden on their religion. And so um, that narrowed the, the uh, sweep because it brings us back to the bare toleration standard from medieval Europe that the government will only refrain from not punishing you for practicing your religion and will not, not coerce you into violating your religion. Well, that was, uh, you know, back to the, uh, it's certainly not the modern accommodation that uh, most of us uh, took for granted back then. Um, the second case, a year later, uh, in the Smith case, the Peyote case, well, the, one of the oldest uh, uh, religious practices in the Western Hemisphere, using that sacred plant of power, uh, uh, was uh, uh, the, uh, the right to do that was before the court in uh, the Smith case in 1990. I went up there. I was attorney of record two times there. There, the court uh, uh, did major surgery on the First Amendment. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. The court said, well, we're going to make an exception here to the, that language. We're going to exempt all criminal laws from the First Amendment and all civil laws of general application that are not expressly hostile to religion. So that's 99.99% of all laws were exempted from the First Amendment by the Supreme Court in the Smith case. Uh, it also, for good measure, it scrapped the uh, court's uh, compelling state interest test for protecting American religious liberty, saying it's too strict and uh, our religious diversity is a luxury. Uh, and any accommodation of religion is no longer the business of the courts. To get it, you got to go to Congress and get into the political arena. So that 
that opinion pretty much gutted the First Amendment. It changed the role of the courts from a protector of religious liberty, uh, liberty and passed that task to Congress. It changed the role of religion in America and placed uh, the sacred under the control of Congress. Um, and it created a religion crisis that all of the denominations rushed back to D.C., worked nights and weekends to get Congress to pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to protect the mainstream religions. Um, so th this is the treatment of our native religions. These cases still stand today, and we have less constitutional protection for worship in our country, all of us in this room, less than most other democracies around the world. Uh, and this bare toleration standard of the Ling case, according to uh, 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 UN Special Rapporteur James Anaya, uh, violates the United States obligation under international law, under, under uh, uh, UN treaties, and this, uh, he said that the US obligation to protect uh, uh, religious liberty uh, applies to any prohibiting any meaningful government restriction on worship. And so uh, this is a case study that demonstrates, in my mind at least, a, a, a need to bring increased uh, religious liberty to Native America. Uh, my final remarks um, is that uh, um, we now see this brand new human rights framework for protecting uh, 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 native uh, peoples here in the United States. After 20 years of going through the the step-by-step uh, -step stages in the UN uh, uh, human rights frame, uh, they finally produced a landmark document that was approved by the General Assembly in the year 2007. And 140, about 148 nations voted in favor of it, except for the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, four of the hardcore uh, settler states. Uh, but this UN declaration, um, uh, which is now supported by over 150 nations, because all four of these nations reversed their policy, including the US, under the Obama administration in 2010. It's the new uh, order of the day. And it ushers in a brand new era for the world's indigenous peoples. Um, and here in the United States, as well as these other 72 nations around the world, um, we now stand at the dawn of a brand new era for the rights of uh, America's native peoples, a human rights era. And that's very significant because uh, this legal framework of federal Indian law is totally bereft of the uh, human rights principle. There's no uh, human rights uh, principles. There's no human rights uh, judicial discourse. In fact, the courts say uh, when defining the rights of Indians, we can't look to abstract notions of justice or get involved in debates over morality. We just got to look at the law as it is. Uh, and uh, which was back then the law of colonialism. And so it's evolved into a rather odd, amoral, um, legal framework that's bereft of the human right principle, and it's got a high tolerance for cases with manifest injustice in them. Uh, but this new UN uh, declaration that we can now see on the horizon two legal frameworks out there for defining the rights of indigenous peoples. One is our existing one, federal Indian law, and now this new human rights framework. Uh, so this is a very historic time in legal history for native people. Uh, it's a jurist generative moment or a lawmaking moment to the challenges to, uh, to uh, implement this uh, declaration into US law and policy, which I think will be the work of a generation. But this uh, declaration, it establishes minimum human rights standards uh, for indigenous peoples worldwide 
that are drawn from the larger body of modern international human rights law. That is UN uh, human rights treaties, the norms in customary international law, and, and the UN simply went to that larger body and pulled out these norms and put them into this declaration to address the unique uh, situation of indigenous peoples to show nations what their human right obligations are to their native people. And in, a, in 48 articles, it establishes a very broad, comprehensive uh, framework. And, and at the heart is the right of self-determination, self-government, the right to culture and language, the right, uh, certain rights in public education, public media, uh, land, land rights, habitat rights, environmental rights. And they're all described as inherent human rights. And that's important because that means these are rights that indigenous peoples already had. The UN didn't give them any rights. Um, and um, that these are the kind of rights that are larger than a nation, uh, that they're the, and, and, and that they're the kind of rights that free and democratic nations were formed to protect that no nation can take away. So they're inalienable rights, they're indefeasible rights. And the UN is urging all of its member nations to implement them into its law and policy so that at long last, as a nation building matter, the indigenous peoples will have the same human rights that the rest of humanity already takes for granted. And so I invite your attention to read this UN declaration because it's, a, it's one of these rare uh, documents that comes along once in a great while that has, holds the promise of literally changing the world, you know. And I think that that uh, uh, um, really does um, present a lifeline, I think, for Native people in the U.S. to come into the body politic with the full measure of their indigenous human rights intact and their uh, vibrant uh, right of self-determination and self-government and culture and religious freedom and all of, all of the above. And that's the right way, I think, to bring Native people into our body politic. Um, with that, uh, I know I've been uh, kind of like a gas bag, I guess, uh, blowing and going up here for quite a while. So. Um, it brings me to my uh, conclusion. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming tonight. I uh, hope you left a lot smarter than when you walked in the door. <laughs> uh, but I pray that the great spirit will be with each and every one of you, you know, in your studies as you go forward here in uh, Colgate University, no matter what your field may be. Uh, uh, may the great spirit be at your side. Thank you. <laughs>